We're going to go to uh, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I've been studying in that chapter. And you know, I like to go where God leads me to go in the Bible to study. I don't believe just studying anywhere. I want to go where God leads me in there. I just I thank God that we're on our way to heaven. That we don't just have hope in this life only. You know what I mean? That we got a waiting place for us. The Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. Everybody that's born again and saved is going there. Some of us are going sooner. Some of us will maybe live to be 80 years old. I don't know. You know, Makes me wonder sometimes like people live to be 100 years old. I don't think I want to live to be 100 years old unless I'm really in good shape. But if God sees fit, that'd be fine. I don't think I'll make it that far, but that's okay. You know, like a Brother Olaf, he ate right. He was a God-called preacher in the 80s. I think he died in 82. And he, he ate right did the right things, but the Lord took him out of here at 68 years old. Think about that. Real obedient man of the Lord. It was just time for him to go right there. Just like Enoch, God scooped him on out of here because he pleased the Lord so much. The Lord said, I just want to give him a big hug and take him on out of here. Way before all those people that lived to be almost a thousand years old, well, God took him out, I think, at 360-something years. I don't know. Anybody know that number? 365. 365 years old, that sounds like a lot to us. But back then during that time, people lived to be almost a a thousand years old. And he was considered one of the young ones and God took him out because he pleased the Lord. He had that testimony, the Bible says. So it ain't always God's will for us to live to be a hundred years old. Sometimes it's time for us to go on. We done ran our course and he took us on out of here. You notice the great men of the Bible, they died young. And they say, Christian history says that all the apostles died a martyr's death. The only one that didn't die a martyr's death was John the Divine. He lived to be like 90-something years old and died on the Isle of Patmos, I think they said. And he was the only one that didn't die a martyr's death. I believe that because every time I say that, I feel God's presence right there. Just think about it. Bartholomew, it tells where he went and how he ministered and they killed him and different ones, you know. They died a martyr's death. They died young. And Peter died. He knew he was going to die. The Lord told him, the time of my departure is at hand. Like Paul the Apostle, he knew the Lord told him. You know, So they died a martyr's death because the gospel wasn't accepted. It it started interfering with the government. And when it did that, that's when they started killing them. You know what I mean? (laughs) That, That gospel. But we appreciate heaven. We appreciate the opportunity to be saved. Thank God He saved our soul and gave us the free gift of eternal life. Thank God for that. And it was so simple. God came down and dealt with our hearts and we cried out to Him with a contract spirit and a broken heart. And Jesus came in our hearts and saved us and made us a partaker with that divine nature. God in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We got heaven on the inside. He said, me and my Father's going to come and make His abode with you. I got the Holy Ghost on the inside and I got the Spirit of Christ on the inside. Both of them are in my soul. God gave me a piece of Him and put it in my soul when I got saved. And my soul is right in there and my life is hid with God in Christ. Thank God for that. If you're saved, the same thing happened to you. If we don't live right, we're still saved on the inside right there. We're protected by God. We're protected from ourselves. Think about that. That's why we can't get unsaved. Because God protects us from our own sorry selves. Our greatest enemy is ourselves. Think about that. We look in the mirror, it ain't the devil. It's our flesh. That's our greatest enemy. We have to constantly put it down. The Bible talks about it. And I like what the Bible says. And, And God realizes that we're the dust of the earth. Thank God. He said, I'm not going to destroy man like that again with a flood all the face of this earth right there. I realize that they're just but the dust of the earth right there. And it's in their heart to do wrong. So we're going to go to... uh, Actually, these are three chapters. Chapter 9, 10, and 11. Has some good things. I'm not going to read them all, but I do want to point out 
a few things in each chapter right here. So in chapter 9, <coughs> verse 19, and this is really something that you will learn in your Christian life. Sometimes you'll learn it the hard way. But you won't know this when you first get saved. You, don't even, you won't even know how to conduct yourself like this. It takes some experiences to go through to get to like what Paul the Apostle went through. Now I'm going to preach against sin and I'm going to lay the hammer down when the Lord allows me to lay the hammer down. But I want to make sure it's the Lord. I don't want to lay the hammer down if God ain't laying the hammer down. But as a thumb rule, Paul the Apostle was showing us something right here. And you know, I didn't really realize this about Paul the Apostle. I preached this before. I didn't realize he was so gentle and long-suffering towards these people until the last few years of my Christian life. I realized that. So he says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all. Let's think about our lives. Have we made ourselves servants unto all? Man, you know, I got a long ways to go right there. And I, like we was at that reunion right there, it made me really realize that. And I've experienced that not too long ago too, being around a crowd of people like that. I just enjoy being around people like that. I'm a little shy, you know, and I try to communicate, I try to smile, things like that. But that, that's what the gospel's all about right there. Being friendly and getting many friends so you can win them to the Lord. Showing yourself friendly and kind and gentle to them when you're in a crowd of people like that. And that's how Paul the Apostle was. That's why he told the Corinthians, he said, you want me to come with a rod or in the spirit of love? You know what I mean? He said, the Holy Ghost is going to make it known. And if, if it was needed, he would lay the rod down. But I don't think by the time he got there, he had to lay the rod down. I think this, they repented at this book right here. He talked about that in the second book that he wrote to him. Well, the third book that he wrote to him. He says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all man, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews became I as Jew. Now he talks a lot, a lot about idols in here. Sitting at the idols table and things like that. I believe Paul went into these places and where the Gentiles were, and sat in there gently with them and didn't condemn them. But if they, they said, this is offered unto idols, he said, I can't be partakers of that right there for conscience sake. He said, not, not mine, but for those that are around about me. You know what I'm talking about? So Paul became just like them. He was like an undercover agent to them so he can win them to the Lord. Unto the Jews, he was like a Jewish person amongst them. He be, behaved himself like a Jewish person. But then he ended up winning to the Jews, some of them. Some of them rejected him, and he had to wash his hands from them and kick off the dust of his feet. Unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to Christ. I know that sounds confusing. But unto the law of Christ to the Gentiles, that I might gain them that are without the law. In other words, people outside of the Jewish community, he become just like them. Now he wasn't partakers of their evil deeds, but he did not. He didn't go out condemning all their little gods, strange gods and things like that. You know, He sort of blended in and he preached Christ unto them. The Bible talks about it. He says, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. And I've thought about that. i got a boy working with me. You know, I try to get on his level. You know what I mean? Try to get on his level. Sometimes they don't really deserve it. But I try to get on his level and tell, make it not feel like I'm better than him or above him. You know what I mean? I think about that. I had a dream about it last night. I ran him off. You know? Right after that, his feelings were hurt. Right after that, I was like, look, you can have your job back. <laughs> you can have your job back. I was trying to teach him lessons. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it says, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Okay. This is the mindset of Paul the Apostle. The Bible says he behaved himself. 
himself wisely. Wherever he went, he said, I behaved myself wisely amongst you. I was counted as the filth of the world back there. Now that's just one little thing I wanted to point out. So let's go to chapter 10. There's a lot of good things in chapter 10. Notice, it talks about Moses in this chapter, right? What the Bible say about Moses? Moses was the meekest man on the face of this earth. He set a good mark. But guess what? Moses got mad. Moses set the people straight. He, he went down, he knew what to do. When they, when they started running their mouths, he went to prayer. And suddenly the glory of God appeared at the door. He said, get up there, I'm going to take care of this right here. And every time they tried to come and get Mo Moses, death followed. Death followed right there. But Moses knew what to do. That kind of stuff. And the devil coming in like a flood. So he says in verse 31. Let's start at verse 30. For if by grace be a partaker. For if I by grace be a partaker. Why am I evil spoken of? For that which I give thanks. Whether therefore you eat or drink. And whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Every move that we need, we make, it needs to be to the glory of God. You know what I mean? Like when I, when I went to that reunion, I prayed about it before we said go. And in my mind, I thought, man, they're going to be drinking everything. No. We went up there, they weren't even drinking. But I just enjoyed their company. Back there. You know what I mean? we got to be interested in other people's lives right there. He said, whether ye, therefore ye drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And he says in another spot, he says, if me makes my brother to offend, I ain't going to be eating meat as long as this world stands. He didn't want to be offensive. You know, he didn't have to. Verse 32. Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's when we walk in perfect love and we give no offense. I don't want this to be a house of offense. I was talking to my wife and well here. I don't want to see one group as higher than the other. Boy, that's, that's out of balance, ain't it? And if the Lord allows you to come up here and sing or preach or come down to the altar or say like that, feel free. I remember when I was in my old church, I just felt so unburdened to pray in the church. You know what I mean? I just felt done worthy to pray. And the devil will try to say, well, they didn't call on you to pray. You ain't worthy enough. That's what the devil always tries to say. He, he has a bunch of tricks and lies up his sleeve. And then he'll make you feel like you're in a little box in a corner somewhere. So let's, let's don't think like that. We just got to think, God's going to use us. He saved us. We're just important as the next person. You know what I mean? God wants to use all his body. And he said that he favors the poor. God favors those that are less esteemed in the church. Matter of fact, he says, make them the judges in the church. Make them that are the least esteemed. Don't get the high brows. Don't get the big, big wheels. Make the lowly the judges. They'll do a righteous judgment. They, they, they've been there, see. They understand about that type of stuff. So he said, give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. Right there, don't be offensive. In other words, don't live wrong in front of them and definitely don't mistreat them. You know what I mean? I ain't reached that mark yet, but I'm trying to get to that mark right there. I'm not saying we're supposed to be a bunch of sissies walking around and just love everybody. But, you know what I mean? I believe in loving everybody. But I, I want to make sure I'm bold enough in the Lord. And guess what I've learned? That God is my boldness. And when he wants me to be bold, it'll just come out. <laughs> it'll just come out. And it, sometimes it strangely just comes out. When I'm around people and I have to rebuke them or something, and they think I'm in the flesh, but I'm not. I won't. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so let's wait on the Lord to let God do the rebuking. But always think about the welfare. Where you go, what you do, your expressions on your face. You know what I mean? I know a lot of times when I preach, I, I look bad when the Lord shouts through me. But I'm not.
just a real expressive type person. If you see me singing, I, I express in my face a lot. But my heart's got joy in it, bringing it out. <laughs> Thank God I never come to this church and plan my sermons out and say, I'm going to get them today. I'm going to get them today. I saw them doing this, and I'm going to get them today. I never preach like that. As a matter of fact, I never plan my sermons out. I just let God do the, do the preaching. Sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's not as strong, but God knows what we need. You know what I mean? So he says, even as I pleased all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. I'm not reached out to myself. But we just gotta learn to be gentle wherever we go. And if God wants us to rebuke somebody for something, he'll let us know. We'll feel it right here. You know what I mean? We'll feel it. And we should be a little bolder. We'll feel it. But as a thumb rule, we want to walk in love. That's what the Bible says, right? I'm not saying none of us is guilty of this, but I'm just saying, I, hey, I ain't reached that mark yet. <laughs> this is the mark that, that Christ set for us. He, he walk, walked in love, but guess what? He had to get bold, too. When the religious crowd come against him, they're trying to catch him in his word. He said they're disputing with him. All the apostles had a dispute with him, too. Matter of fact, he had the power through God to smoke people with blindness. He smoked that man with blindness and called him a devil right there. And that man was blind for many days after that. But he did get his uh, eyesight back, and I guarantee he was a better person. He was trying to stop somebody from getting saved. You know what I mean? So finally, the Lord just smote him with blindness. Just like he smoked those uh, people in Sodom and Gomorrah, those angels come down and smoked them blind, and they couldn't find the door. Paul had that same gift. And he probably had other gifts that he just don't mention right here. He had more gifts than them all. And he had he spoke with tongues more than them all, the Bible says. And that's in the uh, 14th chapter of this book right here. I believe the gift of tongues, simply I taught a little teaching on it. It's simply that there's some Spanish in here that help. No, don't know our language. I can speak in Spanish and they get saved. Me not knowing the Spanish language. That's what the gift of tongues is all about. It wasn't a sign to them that believe, but it's a sign to them that believe not. That they can communicate the gospel. That's what the gift of tongues is all about. Right there. And so he says, even as I pleased all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Right there. That's our main goal is to help precious souls. I can't save them, but I can live right in front of them and leave them to the one that can. That's what Paul was talking about. It's up to a person. If he wants to be saved and born again, he's got to receive the uh, word of God humbly and repent and believe the gospel. The Bible says, God save us such as be of a contrite spirit and a broken heart. That's all it takes. I remember when I got saved, I'll never forget. 20 years old, driving down the road. And the Lord spoke to my heart that night. Now, I've done heard a man of God that morning preach about being born again. I've heard him before. I've heard other men of God before uh, preaching from the mouth of the Lord. And God personally come down and dealt with my heart that night and said unto me, if you don't get saved now, I'll never deal with you again. And when he said that to me, I believed it right then and there with all my heart and I cried out to him. No, Lord, I looked in the back seat because that's where I thought that phrase was coming from. And right when I looked back, I felt the thumb of my heart shaking just like a brand new creature. And it says, Jesus got a light in my heart. He never left me nor forsook me. He'd be with me even unto the end of the world. Thank God for that. I've never felt like God left me. You know that? Even when I was preaching a false doctrine, the Lord was tugging at my heart. Hey, I'm right here. That ain't right. I felt like the Lord was just doing this. That ain't right. He never pursued it. You know what I mean? He be with us even at the end of the world. Thank God for that. And the next verse in chapter 11 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I am also of Christ. And I don't believe in following man, but if a man is a real man of God, He's really trying to serve the Lord. There's nothing wrong with following that man all through his life. I got one more section that I want to uh, 
preach to you now. Eleventh chapter, verse 27. Me and my wife was talking about this on the way here. And we never took of the Lord's Supper. You know, I never had the bread and the wine. We've had a little fear about ourselves in our other church. But if it's the Lord's will, ever we'll do that in here, I believe in that. He says in verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That's one thing you've got to walk in. When we, if we was to ever send the grape juice, that's what we'd use. We wouldn't use real wine. We'd send the grape juice around and a cracker and unleavened bread. We would always have a word of prayer and say, let's examine ourselves. You know what I'm talking about? never want to eat of that if you're not living right. That don't mean you're perfect, but I'm saying if you're not trying to live for the Lord, you don't want to eat of that right. Right there. <clears throat> but this is an ordinance of God. Just like baptism is an ordinance of the Lord, just like foot washing is an ordinance of the Lord. We never did foot washing. Some of you have been in foot washing things. I've prayed about it. I've, I've looked at it in the scriptures, and I just cannot disown that teaching about foot washing. You know what I'm Jesus told us to do it. And see about it. Yep. There's something about it. Jesus wants us to do, but we've never done it. And we've never took communion, but we believe in it. You know what I'm talking about? Well, we got to be care careful how we handle the Word of God. We've got to be careful how we even be a partakers even of the things in the Bible. Because it can be very bad. You know, in the old days, if you didn't wash your hands and clean your feet before you went in the to where the priests were, you could die. Obviously, you could die of that. So they had this golden faucet set up. Well, when the priests come in, they took off their shoes, they cleaned their feet, they cleaned their hands, they went right on there. <coughs> but if they didn't, they can go in there and they can die right there. That was a holy place. It wasn't the holiest of all, but regular folks couldn't go in there. Only the priests could go in this place. And then they had the holiest of all. <coughs> which only the high priest can go in once a year. If he went in there before that once a year, he'd probably die. They did not abuse that back then. And for them, there was something spiritual for them to even build the walls of this place. Okay, God gave them permission to build the walls. That's it. And if that, that wall tore up, they probably prayed about it. Lord, should we work on that thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? They probably feared it. If, you know, all of a sudden something started coming loose or something. They didn't say, oh, I'm going to fix that. Same thing happened to when they put that Ark of the Covenant on the, on the uh, new cart, you know. That man thought he was doing good. He stuck his hand in that cart and he said, here to die. They should have put it on the new cart. There's a certain way to carry that thing. They had to carry it for these uh, staff right there. Only four of them can do it, I believe it was. And only certain people in that religious group could do it. I think for the Levites. Levites carry that thing like this. But they put it on a new car, thought they were doing something real good, you know. And that man that died, he knew all that stuff. Matter of fact, it stayed in his father's house, if I'm not mistaken. It was in his house for so many years. And he laid his hand in that ark, thought he was doing good. You know what I mean? We can get like that in the Lord, think we're doing God a favor. I mean, added some new thing to the church, you know what I mean? That's when we start getting away from the Lord. Start adding new stuff that ain't in the Bible. <coughs> I don't want to add nothing to the Lord. What he wants us to do in the Bible. Sound like a good idea. You know what I mean? Good intention. We don't want to add nothing to the Lord's Bible. We want to do it after the new order, the Bible says. But people begin to die. We can fall away from the Lord right there. So he says in verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And that's on a regular basis. Judging yourself, examining yourself, and then you can have partakers in this. And that one of my friends, he had communion. I went and he had communion in his church. He got a little offended about it. But that was okay. But before that, he had a prayer. And he wanted everybody to examine themselves. Let's pray a prayer of repentance before we eat of this. I think that's a good idea. But I think what he's talking about on a regular basis, you're examining yourself and judge yourself. 